Good afternoon, everyone. Mark Feiner, on behalf of the HDR 10 Plus Technologies LLC, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the first ever HDR 10 Ecosystem Webinar and serve as your host for this event. Over the past few years, all of us have witnessed a number of exciting new developments in digital entertainment. And I'm certain that most of you would agree that few, if any of these, have had such a profound impact on the consumer viewing experience as ultra high definition. Now, as most of you know, UHD encompasses a number of technology advancements, including, but not limited to, 4K or 8K resolution, wider color gamut, and higher frame rate. But of all these improvements, high dynamic range is arguably the most important. It directly affects the storytelling process and delivers the full range of the creative's intent directly to entertainment enthusiasts. During the next hour, we're going to take a closer look at the key role that the HDR10 ecosystem plays in all of this. To address that, we've assembled two great panels that I'll be introducing shortly. We've also reserved a little time in both of these sessions to be taking some questions from all of you. Just click the Q&A button on the right of your screen if you want to log in for this. But to get things started, we felt it was important to have someone who could provide a greater understanding about HDR in general, as well as HDR10 and HDR10 Plus in particular. Pete Leday is a prominent engineering consultant in advanced imaging and sound. He currently serves as CTO of Mission Rock Digital, a San Francisco-based consulting firm in next generation media. Additionally, Pete should be familiar to many of you, since he's a past president of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers and a SEMTI fellow. He also serves as chairman, IDEA, the Immersive Digital Experiences Alliance. So please welcome. Pete well, thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate that and um, that nice introduction, as well as a chance to talk about my favorite topic, which is uh, improving image quality. So um, in the next couple of minutes, I'd like to explain a little bit why I think HDR is important and um, add some cinematic perspective for my friends in Hollywood and how they uh, can relate to that. Uh, I'll get a little geeky talking about how we translate photons of light to electrons, and then also address how we can handle even if all TV sets are not exactly alike. Now, to answer the question, why is HDR important? I think there's really one very simple answer, which is our darn human vision is so good. As you're well aware, uh, the human visual system is able to read things from very dark stars at night up until bright sunlight and everything in between. When expressed as a brightness level in nits or candelas per square meter, that represents a trillion to one ratio using your eye accommodation to be able to adjust for that. Now, a traditional standard dynamic range television is far beneath that. It's a small subset and it doesn't really give you the full lifelike appearance. But over the course of the last decade, engineers have figured out that if you are able to expand that to just a few more orders of magnitude, maybe up to a million to one contrast, it provides a substantially beneficial uh, image experience. And that's what HDR is all about. Uh, why is that important? Well, when you look at scenes in real life, you're able to make out very dark shadow details that uh, uh, convey texture and background to it. Now, your diffuse white is fine. That would be the white reflecting off of a piece of paper or a tablecloth. But um, there's other light sources that are even brighter than that and need to be represented as such direct light, whether it's from a sunlight or headlights of a car, need to be brighter than reflected light off of a white surface. That's what HDR is all about. And cinematographers have known this for a long time. They've been able to use high dynamic range to express um, the mood through using contrast and mysteriousness through um, the uh, shadow details and to add a vibrancy using these specular reflections and to be able to adjust the brightness. Uh, us engineers often look at what we call HDR images and something like this. Here's a picture that has some bright stuff and some dark stuff. Therefore, it's HDR. But the cinema um, filmmaking community is much more sophisticated. And going back a few years, uh, the Academy of uh, the American Society of Cinematographers worked with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences to do 
test shoots. They were shooting specifically to learn how HDR works, evaluate cameras under different lighting conditions in various environments and understand the workflow for that. And that resulted from some really good education where the industry learned a whole lot about how to make images look good, leveraging HDR format. And using typical scenes like this, they were able to analyze those, starting with this 18% reflectance, which is the mid-gray level, and realizing that we need to go about six or seven stops below and six or seven stops above. A T-stop is similar to an F-stop. Every stop is about double the light level. So this tells you that you need 14 or 15 stops to really get a good HDR image in a camera. And you don't stop there because you need to be able to you know, use these for all sorts of um, storytelling aspects of it. Here are some examples of it from a Netflix series that Eric Messerschmidt um, shot. Um, and it's subtle, but you're able to see details in the back and bright highlights that really are uh, very fundamental to the story. And our cinematographer here, Mer Messerschmidt, was quoted as saying, I want all of these choices to be available to me, so when appropriate, I can saturate a color or blow out a window. Having the added range is to our benefit, but it's also our responsibility to use it to tell the story. And I think that he's speaking on behalf of many of the cinematographers, filmmakers, and directors that I've seen across all these platforms. And it's not just about the principal photography, but it's also the visual effects pipeline, the compositing, the color grading. And you want to be able to color grade your final step, go out to one consistent format, and have it accurately reproduced on whatever TV set it's going. And that's where these formats come in. That's accommodated in part through this thing called the Academy Color Encoding System, which you'll sometimes hear about in Hollywood. It takes any camera and transforms it into a common space where I could do look corrections and then exports it off to the device of my uh, intent, such as an HDR10 or 10 plus display. Now, this all comes down to converting photons of light to electrons. And you probably remember from 30 years ago learning about analog to digital conversion. If I take one pixel, the brightness of it can be expressed in multiple steps. As it gets brighter, I assign it a higher number. In this case, I've given it eight numbers from zero to seven. Of course, it's digital, so I use the binary codes, and that means I need to have three bits to be able to convey that. So here's a three-bit quantization. Now, that's gonna look really bad. Here's an example of what banding is like when I have five bits, obviously not enough to convey the subtle gradations necessary, and eight bits, which is common for standard dynamic range, and looks pretty good. However, if, when I go to high dynamic range and I have a broader range of dark to light highlights, I need to expand that with more stair steps or bit depth, and in that case, I need at least 10 bits to be able to accurately convey it. 10 bits represents just over a 1,000 individual discrete steps from black to white, and uh, it's about 20% or 25% more than my 8-bit payload. So it it's, uh, doesn't come for free because I have to send more bits. However, um, the compression standards and, and pipelines are well up to it. Now that I know that I have a black to white stair step, I need to somehow assign a code value to each uh, degree of photons of light. And that's done by what's called an electro-optical transform function. And if I look at the left, I take my scene light, convert it into electrons with an OETF, send it, send it over to the home uh, where the EOTF, electro-optical, converts it back to display light. Now, you might think that that's just done linearly. I double the amount of light and I double the code value, but it doesn't work like that. Your eye is much more sensitive to tiny gradations in the black levels and that's uh, represented in the black line, which is the gamma curve that have been built into television sets since the 1950s. So gamma has been adequate for standard dynamic range, but a good deal of research and investigation was necessary to figure out the EOTF for high dynamic range. Uh, it started with things like the hybrid log gamma, or HLG, and this started with that old 1950s gamma curve and extended it with the hybrid a log, so it's a logarithmic curve to do the highlights for it. And this is simple and has the advantage of being able to be backwards compatible to standard uh, dynamic range television sets, and it works well for broadcasting. But the content creators needed more. They wanted to be sure that the displays that people are looking at are accurately creating artistic intent, and that's where uh, perceptual quantization comes to bear. It's called PQ for short. And note here in this curve that 75% of those numeric code values are assigned to those dark areas below middle gray. 
uh, which is the way your eye works, and therefore it's much more accurate in terms of putting this uh, into the electronic format. Fortunately, PQ, largely developed by Dolby, but with lots of other help, um, was codified back in 2014 by the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers as an international standard, uh, ST2084, and that's been baked into the HDR10 format. So that's an optimized way of being able to express these. So as a quick review, we need at least 10 bits instead of your grandpa's eight bits of quantization. And we needed to upgrade our electro-optical transfer function to better match what your eyes are and preserve creative intent. But TV sets are all different and we need to accommodate for that. So for example, I might have a thousand nit television set capable in the living room and a 650 nit in the bedroom. And I wanna be able to run the same content on both of them accurately. To do that, there's a technique called tone mapping. Tone mapping is, as the name implies, simply adjusting according to the brightness of the picture. But it's not as simple as turning the brightness and contrast. You really need to adjust those accurately. And to do that, you, we send data called metadata along to the TV set, which tells it, instructs it, how to reconstruct all those colors, sending a color volume, average light, maximum light levels. Uh, in HDR10, this is a static metadata based on the highlights of the show, the, the brightest images, and is based on these standards once again. So it's not anything proprietary or complex or secret. It's very easily, readily available metadata. But there's even better ways to do that if you're trying to fine tune the optimization of the tone mapping using dynamic metadata. So this does everything the static does, plus allows you to optimize each scene each scene is assigned a given value and is um, able to do a tone mapping curve uh, accordingly. The luminance statistics are gathered automatically during the mastering process with different gray scale levels. Uh, pixel counts are done based on nine different levels and then these statistics go into the tone mapping curve and it's fully backwards compatible to the HDR10. So if the display device is able to read the dynamic metadata, you're gonna get an even better optimization of the tone mapping curve. All that dynamic metadata, once again, is part of an industry standard used in uh, HDR10+, Plus. it's the SMPTE 2094 curve. Uh, so in summary, HDR10+, Plus has an optimized tone mapping. It's a straightforward mastering process, future-proof, because it supports up to the 8K resolution at 16 bits quantization, if you have pipelines big enough, and 10,000 displays when we figure out how to do that economically. It's an open standard. Now, in terms of who's using these formats based on those advantages, uh, there's this uh, uh, analyst, Yori Gutskins, that does a great job at putting these Venn diagrams together, showing you all the manufacturers. And this is the one we just updated based on Yori's last version. Uh, and as you can see, virtually everybody in this big blue circle is supporting the HDR10 format based on this PQ and uh, static metadata. Um, uh, and then a number of uh, manufacturers have already adopted HDR10 plus as a subset of that. So that's been very uh, good adoption in the industry. But look at video streaming systems, um, again, very much the same. All, all but one of the services is supporting HDR10 already, and quite a few are already uh, uh, upgrading to this uh, dynamic metadata of the HDR10. But there's still developments going on. For, ex for example, we realize that the way that the tone mapping occurs should be different in a very bright viewing environment versus a very dark one. And yes, there are answers for that as well. Right now we're working on things like, that call the HDR10 plus adaptive. So this adds all the benefits, the dynamic metadata plus adjusts the tone mapping according to how bright your viewing room is. And this is something I'm looking forward to seeing in the near future. So in summary, high dynamic range brings sufficient, but, uh, significant benefits to the cinematic community and your storytelling. The encoding is a necessity to upgrade from your SDR, meaning more bits of quantization and uh, improved EOTF. Tone mapping allows you to play it on any of the devices and there's both static and active versions of that. It's broadly adopted and we're adding more in terms of the ambient light compensation. So with that quick flyby, I'll turn it back to you, Mark, and you can continue with the panel discussions. Pete, that was great. Thank you so much for such a detailed and outstanding overview. So let's take a closer look now at some of the key issues related to both content production and distribution, as well as consumption by end users. 
Our first panel on the HDR content experience, moderated by Stephanie Prang, the editor-in-chief and associate publisher of Media Play News. There she is. Stephanie's been covering the home entertainment business for nearly three decades. She's had a front row seat as the industry has pivoted from VHS to DVD and Blu-ray, and most recently to digital delivery and direct-to-consumer streaming. Please welcome Stephanie, and Stephanie, please introduce your panel. Hi, thanks, Mark. So, um, I wanted to introduce our panel today. First of all, we have Angeli Wheeler, and she is a tech lead manager at Android Team for YouTube. And we also have Ben Wagner, principal video specialist at Amazon Prime Video. We had also confirmed Eric King is deluxe at Deluxe Cinema as a panelist. Unfortunately, Eric came down with a severe fever late yesterday and won't be able to participate today. We wish him a speedy recovery, but we will forge on. All right, thanks for joining, Angelie and Ben. Um, first of all, can you each give us a brief summary of your experience working in HDR and more specifically the HDR 10 Plus format? Would you like to begin, Anjali? Sure. Uh, so I led the development of HDR for mobile devices at YouTube, and later on we added HDR 10 Plus support. And uh, this was a very interesting uh, path because we found that uh, most of the content was created with TVs in mind. And uh, TVs are mostly indoors. Nobody carries them out into the sun. And people don't use the same device for like reading text on a white background. So there were a lot of that adjustments we had to make to make HDR work well on mobile devices. Uh, and that's where HDR 10 plus metadata helps a lot. Uh, we also tried uh, ambient light adjustment as uh, Pete spoke about, but uh, again, mobile devices are challenging because uh, the ambient sensor on the mobile devices is on the bezel. Sometimes people hold them with their fingers and it's occluded. So I'll be succinct here, but I think that's where I end. <laughs> Interesting. All right, Ben, how about you? Uh, what's your experience working HDR and HDR 10 plus? Yeah, Prime Video was an early adopter of HDR. We were the first uh, subscription service to launch with it back in 2015. And we were also the, uh, and had great results with that, you know, pioneered uh, post-production for uh, episodic television for HDR as well. Um, and uh, we were also the uh, first uh, service provider to adopt HDR 10 plus. Um, and, uh, you know, we said the advantages of it are so great and the background compatibility is there. So 100% of our HDR 10 content has HDR 10 plus metadata. So if you're watching HDR on Prime Video, it, it has the metadata in it. Um, and so it's really for customers to do if you are watching uh, HDR content on a TV Sports HDR 10 Plus, it'll take advantage of that metadata and improve your picture quality. And if you're watching it on a TV that doesn't have it, you get the normal HDR 10 experience uh, with no drawbacks to it there. Can you both kind of describe what makes HDR and then HDR 10 Plus, what the difference is, that what, how the consumer would see it? Yeah, I think about uh, with, uh, you know, HDR 10 Plus, you know, describes kind of like how bright and how colorful things you can, you can get on a per shot basis there. And so a TV doesn't need to keep the, or display doesn't need to get some kind of headroom in case it'll get even brighter yet, because you kind of know what's going to be happening there. Uh, you're able to use the full range of the display's properties, you know, all the way up without headroom. Um, and so that lets you get brighter, more saturated colors. That kind of stuff. And it particularly helps when in bright ambient light or in more mass market price devices where the panels aren't incredibly good. Um, really helps get the, the really increases the value of the experience uh, on those devices. Uh, I can go take with my take. So, uh, well, if you imagine watching a two hour movie, the HDR metadata applies the same treatment for the entire length of the two hour movie. And HDR 10 Plus gives us scene by scene changes that we can apply. For example, if it's a dark scene, we can apply tone mapping particularly suitable to that dark scene. If it's an extra bright scene, we can again change the tone mapping. So it allows us to change tone mapping on a per scene basis. Right. So it just, if it was just HDR 10, it would be the same throughout the whole 
And then HDR10 plus changes on a scene by scene basis based on the metadata that comes in. And we often hear about the role that metadata plays um, in defining HDR. How important is accurate metadata creative process? Well, that's essential. If it's wrong, the display mapper will do the wrong thing. And yeah, I mean, if you like, you know, got a number off by, you know, at an extra zero or missing one in a number there, the image can look terrible. So it's essential. Yeah, during the development of HDR, we got the metadata wrong quite a few times, and I can tell you it looks really horrible. <laughs> Same. And then, uh, Ben, given Amazon Video's experience with HDR10+, um, how many compatible programs do you currently offer to your subscribers? Everything we have in HDR, which is thousands of, of movies and TV episodes, uh, is in a, available in HDR10+. Plus. So you can guarantee that you know anything you watch on Prime Video is going to have has the dynamic metadata. If it's HDR10 content, we'll have the HDR10 plus metadata. We have some selected titles in Dolby Vision, which also has the metadata there. So you, uh, yeah, it's always available to customers, and uh, the metadata is there for as much as your display can take advantage of it. Are there any barriers to increasing the number of? Uh, I mean, for, for us, we system, I mean, either like a, a, a studio could provide the metadata if they've created, done creative work on it, or we will actually generate uh, the metadata describing the content if it doesn't come in with that. So really, if it's an HDR title that's delivered to Amazon, we will ensure there's H, there is HDR 10 plus metadata for it in every case. So really, the only thing we need to do to get more HDR 10 plus content is just get more HDR content. Interesting. Which we're doing rapidly. Um, and this, I think, is for you, Angeli. Um, Knowing the popularity of user-generated content, how easy is it for someone to post HDR10 or HDR10 Plus content on YouTube? How do they go about that? So one piece of ease is the cost. A lot of YouTube creators are not seasoned uh, video professionals. So affordability of cameras and affordability of color grading monitors is a very big piece. And over the last few years, the cost of equipment has gone down. I would say the high end of the equipment is still as expensive as it used to be. But now there's availability of low end and mid end equipment that can be used to author and create HDR content. So that has improved a lot in the last few years. The other piece of ease is expertise and knowledge. That I am afraid has not improved in the sense uh, users have to know a great deal about color gamuts and it's and other details of how HDR uh, works to be able to author a really compelling HDR content. Would you have an example of what kind of co compelling content that would be as far as HDR? Uh, I mean, there are quite a few videos that uh, are really, uh, you could say, just show the color gamut or the range of uh, brightness uh, very much. So, so like if you search on YouTube, there, there's a lot of really good con content out there. Good. Um, how do consumers know when they're getting HDR10 Plus or HDR10 Plus, uh, HDR10 or HDR10 Plus content on their platforms? How, how are they aware of it? Uh, in case of for Prime Video, we just do it automatically. Um, and we don't really necessarily, we don't really have an indicator that says it's HDR10 plus or not, because we don't always know if a given device is going to use that metadata or not. So we thought it'd be kind of confusing to say, we're sending you an HDR10 plus stream, even though your TV can't actually use that data there. So we just indicate it's HDR, um, and uh, it just, customers can rest assured that if they're watching HDR10, they are receiving the HDR10 plus metadata. Yeah, it's a similar answer for YouTube. We don't highlight that uh, this content is HDR, but some creators just put the word HDR in their name of the video. So that's how users know. Or if they open in the quality selector, it says HDR there. That's how they know that they are watching an HDR content. Now, HDR is often perceived as a race between formats with the highest peak brightness or nits, as he talked about earlier, declared the winner. From a creative workflow standpoint, is that the correct goal? And if not, 
Why wouldn't it be? I mean, really, it depends on the kind of story you're trying to tell. Uh, you know, honestly, like in kind of typical lighting conditions, the difference between a 1,000 nit and a 4,000 nit video isn't that hugely different. I mean, if you got like a display with really small local dimming zones or, you know, individual pixel LEDs or it's OLED, stars would be a little bit brighter because they're, they're often just like a single pixel of like super brightness there. But it doesn't really uh, have a huge impact. I mean, the difference between SDR and HDR is much bigger, the difference between 1,000 and 4,000 nits there. And so it's really a matter of the uh, you know, creatives tell the story what they want to have. In our library, we've got some content where the, where the brightest single nit is 120 nits, and other ones where it's you know, 4,000, and I think a few cases more than that. So it really varies a lot there. But it, you know, it's really you know, the job of the TV to just try to preserve the creative intent as accurately as possible. And um, yeah, different stories uh, benefit from different kinds of brightness and contrast. And HDR, the benefit of HDR goes far beyond that of just being brighter. It's that, you know, before, like all that rich detail in the shadows, you can see a black cat sleeping on a leather jacket in the shadows. At the same time, you see the bright noonday sun, you know, and reflections off cars in the same frame. And SDR simply can't show those things at the same time. So really, once you're in HDR worrying about Nits is, uh, yeah, it's a nice to know thing there, but that's not the big the question. I find the color gamut at least equally compelling, if not more compelling than the brightness. And if you look at the color chart where it displays the SDR and the HDR portions, there are shades of green that we could not even display with previous class of uh, displays. And now we have a lot more color range to play with. There are colors we could not display before. And uh, so brightness is important, but I would say color gamut is equally important and it uh, gives us new uh, like colors to play with. Yeah, they both are kind of star players in 4K. When <laughs> when that came out, we everyone realized, wow, those were important additions. Um, and you've both been involved with HDR for some time. What changes have occurred in the industry since your initial exposure to HDR content? versus how it's implemented today? What, what's the progress been like? I think we see more standardization around like like how bright should faces be, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So we saw in the first like few years, we saw a huge variation. Some people basically made an HDR master, but like, I'm just gonna make it look like my SDR, you know, just use the, only the range of things I could have done in SDR, but an HDR envelope, other people doing just wild, like exaggerated things too there. I think we kind of more coalesced around kind of what looks good and um, has a kind of consistency in that, which only benefits storytelling, in my opinion, there, just because it's not good if all, it's like you have to change your brightness between different, two different shows or highly variant. Um, so that's been a big thing. And also it's really become standard. I mean, just, you know, that, I mean, like every prime original show we do for the last six years, except for some of our kids shows, has been shot and posted in HDR. And we've really been HDR for, uh, first for a long time. Lots of our partners are also, you know, giving us tons of HDR content. It's hard to find a Hollywood movie that's not available in HDR. that has been made recently. So just the ubiquity of the content is huge. And the size of the audience for it is huge as well. You know, like the percentage of TVs out there that people are watching on that have HDR support. And also mobile devices. I mean, you know, most recent phones have a playback HDR as well. So just the audience has gotten uh, huge. Yeah, the cost of uh, HDR TVs have come down a lot, and uh, like now you can find them in everyone's living rooms, and of course in uh, mobile devices, as Ben said. So that's been a big equalizer. And uh, even from the creator part, uh, like color grading monitors used to be very, very expensive, but now you can have desktop monitors with support HDR. So uh, I would say the price uh, and the cost of equipment in this TVs has bring down uh, like made them available to everyone. Can we talk about like a movie or episodic TV that highlights the benefits of HDR in a particular frame or a scene? I mean, I know I have been with directors who will say, oh, look, you can see the um, way the, the, the fabric of his costume, <laughs> the details of the fabric of the costume. I mean, there were things, or the brightness of uh, a light compared to the darkness of a scene. Can you think of some scenes where it's really impressed upon you the difference between yeah. standard 
Yeah. Yeah. In our early days of doing HDR back in 2015, ever we have a show called Red Oaks. We did, um, and it's uh, the opening scene is shot at a like a public tennis court at night. And the SDR version, I mean, it looks like TV there, you know, um, it's kind of a light, it's kind of bright, and you can see things, there's things in the shadow there, but it's very flat there. And the HDR version of it, all of a sudden, that bright light was bright, like the way that outdoor lighting and the sporting thing is bright. And uh, there were things in the shadow, the characters in the shadows there, but you could see someone's facial expression, even when they weren't that well lit. And you could see, uh, like, that it was, you could see dark green of the court. You can't really do dark and green at the same time in SDR, but all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, that cord is green. I can tell that it's green even though it's in the shadows. And so there's all kinds of images I'd never seen before. Um, the other one was our show Bosch. Uh, there was a scene where he's walking through some uh, you know, uh, neon lights, you know, neon signage in Chinatown or whatever, and all of a sudden there's this really bright violet sign, which is a color you see in the real neon signs all the places there, but literally mathematically cannot be expressed in SDR. Also, it's like, oh wow, that's a bright purple thing. And you can't do bright purple without HDR. I don't know, Angelie, did you have any? Uh, so I remember Man in the High Castle was the first uh, like uh, properly produced HDR show that uh, I watched. And there were a couple of indoor scenes with there was just one bright light in the room and everything else was perfectly dark. And uh, and you could see that the clarity in the dark uh, areas of the scene while still having a very bright light in the room. So uh, that's the scene that comes to my mind in particular. Yeah. It's yeah, a part of realness. I mean, it feels like being in that real environment under those conditions much better than SDR can. I remember you. It's yeah. Mark, we have a couple questions from our audience that we'd like to get to before we run okay. out of time. We're going uh, to turn to the questions, and Mark, you take over. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to ask them directly to save time for everyone. Anjali, okay. you mentioned before in regards to uh, expertise and knowledge. What steps, we were asked, is uh, YouTube taking and your team taking to better educate your YouTube enthusiasts about how to deploy HDR more effectively? Uh, so we try to make, uh, like, uh, have more tutorials, have more, uh, uh, you could say, step-by-step uh, uh, -step process of creating an HDR video. But again, so like, uh, we are more involved with the distribution and uh, side of things. And creation is, uh, like, there are a lot more companies which are involved with creation who are, like, editing tools and creative tools. No, that's good. And that's a good segue to the second question that is addressed to Ben. Uh, ben, Amazon Prime Video has a lot of exclusive content that you work directly with content creators to acquire and deliver to your various subscribers. Are there any specific things you're doing in collaboration to develop or enhance the overall viewer experience to your audience as it relates to HDR? Yeah, for HDR, I mean, you know, for, if it's a original content that we're producing itself, and because we know, if you're making a show for Amazon, you know a big chunk of your audience is going to watch the HDR version. Um, and so, you know, we have our, we emphasize that to our creatives, and we're doing posts, you know, make, they know that they're doing an SDR grade and an HDR grade, um, going into that. In the early days, we did a lot of hand-holding. I had a, a direct report basically down in Hollywood for a year, figuring out how post houses could do cost-effective uh, post of episodic TV for HDR and that kind of stuff and working with, you know, doing camera tests, all that kind of stuff. So in the early days, we had to do a lot of on the ground there. But I think people, a lot of creators pretty much know what they're doing right now and as they go through our process are doing a pretty excellent job. I mean, sometimes we'll also acquire a show that's already been finished in some other market or it's like a movie at Sundance, something like that, that maybe wasn't designed for HDR, but then we use our expertise to help them post it. Um, right. and make an HDR version out of it. Well, this has been great, everybody. Uh, Stephanie, thanks to you, Ben and Anjali, for such a dynamic discussion. We're going to now go on to our final session, which takes a closer look at some of the issues related to HDR televisions and connected devices. Our session is moderated by Greg Tarr, who serves as the managing editor of HDGuru.com, which specializes in news and feature reporting about the consumer electronics industry. There's Greg. Greg's a 28-year veteran 
of the consumer electronics business. He's covered the development, marketing, and sales of a variety of AV products, including TVs and home theater systems. Prior to joining HD Guru, he was also an editor at CE Trade Publication Twice. Greg, welcome and take it away. Alfred, with regard to the HDR 10 and 10 plus SOCs business, what percentage of the TV and smartphone market does your company represent today? Yeah, um, my name is Alfred Chan. I'm the Vice President of Product Marketing for MediaTek. Uh, MediaTek is a fourth largest uh, semiconductor company, Fabless. Uh, we ship close to about 65 to 7% of the TV market space. Uh, we're number one in TV market shares and also number two in mobile, number one in Chromebook. Uh, revenues for MediaTek is close to about 12 billion US dollars last year. Uh, on the TV side, the entire TV market has close to about 250 million TVs per year shipped. MediaTek shipped 170 million chips. So uh, we're a significant uh, portion of the market shares. As far as the TV SOC is concerned, we shipped uh, 8K TVs, uh, to 4K TVs, uh, to Full HD TVs. Uh, we ship to all five continents with six or seven different OS. As far as all the TV uh, SOC ship today, uh, pretty much every one of them support HDL10 and also HDL10 Plus since 2018. Fantastic. Uh, Bill Mandel, um, Vice President of Relations at Samsung uh, Research America, uh, as a driving factor in the HDR10 Plus adoption since 2017, where does the uh, HDR10 Plus Technologies LLC put the total size of the user base? Yeah, the, the LLC, we don't really track the, the user base per se. We, we put up the certified devices on our website, the HDR10 Plus.org. But um, it's very easy to um, access the licensing program. It's, it's meant to be a, um, a thing to guarantee quality to the end user there. It's easy to sign up for the, for the program. There's no uh, per unit royalty and there's flexibility. It leaves flexibility of implementation to the, the TV makers while certifying uh, quality. Uh, I'll throw this out to, to all three of you. Uh, is there still room for growth for HDR10 Plus at this juncture? And, and why do you think that? Uh, Bill, do you want to start us off? Sure. Sure. I think um, already we've seen that because of the, the ease of entry that I just mentioned, we've had extensive support for devices. You've heard the, the, the volume of uh, SOCs that, that Alfred is shipping. You know, there's eight or 10 TV makers on, on, on the website. It's been going for a number of years. Um, mobile phones as well are on like second, third generation, two tiers of chips from, from, from Qualcomm. And the metadata itself, is, as Pete showed, is statistical in nature. So without getting into the te technology, it's, it's simply generated. It's calculated just more rapidly than HDR10 is. HDR10 is calculated once per show. HDR10 Plus is calculated once per every relevant scene and it allows for an easy in-place upgrade. So what we're doing now is looking for HDR10 services that we can flip to 10 plus by simply uh, calculating the metadata on the assets they have. Uh, Tom Doherty, uh, where does the HTS, uh, HTSA see HDR10 plus today and what kind of growth do you see ahead? Um, we see, you know, continued growth and continue uh, appreciation for the kind of performance people are seeing when they come into showrooms and uh, look at just flat panel displays as well as uh, the projection solutions that we're delivering. So uh, we, we expect to uh, see continued steady growth as, as awareness can be increased amongst the public. Great. Uh, Alfred, uh, HDMI connectivity is critical in the evolution of the success of almost any new AV integration technology. And with regard to this, how has the transition been going for HDR10 and HDR10 Plus concerning protocols for HDMI 2.1? Yeah, so um, talk about HDMI 2.1. Uh, you know, last year, the game box is really exciting. It brings so much excitement to HDMI 2.1. 
uh, with high frame rate, all the new features. HDL uh, definitely is a very important requirement for protocols. Um, as all the panels have talked about in the previous panel, that accurate presentations for metadata, uh, the brightness, uh, the picture quality are absolutely essential uh, so that the TV can receive the correct information to display uh, the tone mapping of the contents to the TV. So it's absolutely important. I think that it can be improved. Uh, we work very hard with the HDMI form in terms of interoperability. Uh, we would do uh, much more efforts going forward to make sure that uh, the direct intent of the metadata uh, is accurately presented. Uh, it is very important to make sure it is done accurately frame by frame. Uh, it's, it sounds easy, but it's a pretty complex process, it is. So we will be doing very, very hard to make sure that that is presented accurately. Um, how, how does the HDSA see this issue? Are there any significant uh, hang-ups with the integration of HDMI 2.1 and HDR? Um, most of these things have smoothed out much more than, you know, just a few years ago. There were a lot of challenges with um, with these transitions, but uh, the overall, it's less and less of an issue that our, that our members are facing. It's something that they know how to troubleshoot. Uh, so HTSA members and high-end custom integrators are, have acquired um, skill sets on being able to troubleshoot and resolve issues, uh, but they seem to be less and less than what they were just a few years ago. And Bill, uh, the HDR 10 Plus Technologies uh, Association, uh, does it have any type of support program if there are protocol problems? Um, it's actually part of the certification. So we have HDMI protocol testing, both for source devices, as well as for, for televisions that they're sending and receiving the metadata. And so I think that has made a big difference in, in, in resolving these issues. As you know, four or five years ago, it was challenging to plug up an HDR10 device to a, to a television and you weren't sure if it was gonna work or the cable, this or that, but that's all been smoothed out. And I, I think a big part of it actually has been our certification program, making sure that that all works. And when we hear about problems today, from within my company, we actually advise people, go get it certified. That'll guarantee that it works. Great. Uh, Tom, we're almost seven years into the launch of the first HDR-enabled televisions. How good a job has the CE industry done at delivering the HDR message in a consistent and comprehensible manner to consumers so far? Um, you know, speaking from the custom in integration channel, I think the CE in industry has has educated salespeople, system designers, and, and our field technicians who can explain the technologies and benefits to their clients. However, um, I think the CE industry needs to do a, a better job at creating awareness of the benefits of HDR to the consumer. Very few clients have, have spoken to many of our members recently just to kind of confirm this, but very few clients ask questions nor confirm that HDR technology is, is part of the entertainment solution or, or spec or feature. It, it, it doesn't really get brought up, honestly. Uh, they're benefiting from it. Um, you know, our, our, our members are good at demonstrating it, but in terms of I think the industry uh, needs to do something to increase the awareness of this uh, so that uh, customers are, are, are asking about it or so that we can you know, point them in the right direction. Is there anything in particular your members are looking for in the way of demonstration or marketing support from uh, you know, HDR 10 plus or C CTA for that matter? Um, you know, with regard to demonstration materials, um, there's an abundance of sources and demo reels uh, in use by custom integration firms in their showroom. Uh, these things are kind of already in place. Um, you know, we can do great demos now. Um, but, you know, however, uh, as I stated previously, a greater effort needs to be made by all of the companies involved with HDR in order to increase consumer awareness because our customers are not usually asking about HDR. Uh, additionally, there's there's really little motivation 
to bring it up specifically in today's CI world, um, since dealers are reviewing much more than the video performance and the technology aspects of, of the solutions they are proposing. We have limited time with clients, um, and during those meetings, we got to review other things such as their network needs, their automation needs, lighting controls, window treatment. So there's a lot to, to uh, help a client with technology and um, we're certainly positioned to help explain it and educate them. But if they're not really bringing it up, um, you know, there's uh, not a lot of motivation on, on our end. So I think this is really on the industry's end to uh, have customers uh, curious about it um, and ask for it more. I'll throw it out to, to Bill and Alfred. What what more can the industry do to, to get the ball rolling faster on HDR? Yeah, I think it's really just talking about it and, and understanding, helping people understand that it's there. I think it's getting the sales staff in, in a big box retailer to, to understand, to be able to say even that the demo videos that are running in a store, hey, this is HDR or this isn't HDR and, and you really want to look for that. Luckily, it's kind of becoming a below the line technology and that HDR is in almost every TV. We've got the equalizer with HDR 10 plus is going to give you that HDR image no matter what. So it's, it's, it's good for the customer all the way around. And so that's why we're just looking at growing the, um, the ecosystem of the streaming companies so that you can be assured as a consumer that, that you're getting the picture quality that is the best that your TV can handle. And what we've introduced this year with the LLC is an ambient light correction that, that still preserves creative intent. And that's really important because there's been a, a number of complaints about HDR can be dark sometimes. I think this takes care of it and makes it really watchable in any environment, yet maintains the latitude of the visual experience. And it just continues to make the, the videos pop and look really great in your home. Yeah. So on. On the MediaTek side, uh, basically what we do is that we improve the technology on the team. Uh, we have uh, actually increasing the number of zones all the way to 10,000, you know, from 2,000 zones. So give you a very good uh, capability to, uh, you know, demonstrate the contrast. And as previously talked about, needs uh, are actually quite important. Uh, we see that the needs increases uh, from 1,000, 2,000 uh, to 3,000 needs on high-end TVs. Um, also, we applied a lot of artificial intelligence capability. Uh, where the brain power behind the TV actually. Almost all the processing on TVs are done on the SOC side. So um, in terms of AI, uh, as, as Bill has mentioned, you know, the ambient uh, light is really important. Uh, so we actually, um, you know, with AI, we actually detect the scenes, detect the ambient, make sure that we get the best tone mapping in considering the two and use AI technique to automatically adjust the screens. Uh, those days of Menu adjustment, uh, I'm sure that you go to the control panel to adjust the brightness and the vivid mode and all that. I think in about a few years are gone. Um, AI would basically give the capability uh, of the users to uh, easy of use so that you can actually get the best picture quality automatically. Right. Uh, now looking ahead, Nvidia Tech's uh, MiraVision chip chipset offers a wide range of capabilities for SDR, HDR, HDR10+, plus, and even real-time playback enhancements. How is this going to help shape the future of the HDR experience? Yeah, Mirror Vision is a very exciting technology. Uh, we, at MediaTap, we really like to improve the picture quality view experience so people can continue to buy uh, better and better TVs, um, better and better experience. HDR10 Plus offers uh, very concise definitions of frame-by-frame uh, -frame accurate, high dynamic range, and contrast, sharpness, uh, and picture quality is everything uh, that we care for. And so HDR10 Plus offers that capability. Uh, and Mirror Vision, uh, also on top of that, add a bunch of uh, AI technology that we've been spending the last six or seven years, improving picture quality, super resolution, upscaling, uh, contrast, all that. Yeah, and also Y color gamut. So um, yeah, we're very excited for the future. Um, we're excited that TV technology improve every year. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Um, and to to end it before we go into the uh, questions um, from the audience, 
how smooth an implementation process has HDR10 Plus enjoyed in today's AV products ecosystem compared to other profiles based on dynamic range metadata? I'll throw that out to anyone who wants to take it. I have just a frame of reference for HDR10 Plus. My, my lab here in Irvine, we, we offer field engineering support to companies that are making devices if, if they, they need any help. And it's been surprising like how little help companies have needed. We've been able to basically be at the ready to do device testing if somebody has a new device and they check if they've turned it on, if it worked or not. I guess the issues like Anjali had said they found when they had first started, they were able to resolve themselves. Um, we, we worked like getting this thing into the VP9 codec, which was what YouTube was using, was their primary codec a couple of years ago. That all happened by just people reading the specs and they come back and show it to us. Yep, that works. So it, it's been actually too easy almost because it's like I would have expected to be like problems and up all night and stuff. And it was very smooth. All the, all the companies we worked with picked it up. No problem. Hey, Greg, it's Mark. We're running a little short on time, but I wanted to raise one question uh, to the panel from one of our attendees who actually watched Tom deliver a presentation at the recent HTSA Spring Summit. And I think, Tom, paraphrasing your comment, you made a point about the need to make the entire end user experience easier and more convenient. And I'd like to ask the panelists, uh, based on the question, what do you each think we need to do to help that process along more quickly and effectively? I'd like to hear Alfred uh, weigh in a little bit more on this because I agree with him that, um, you know, the days of uh, tuning dials or bringing in uh, people to calibrate your set uh, should be over when people buy high performance products and can consume high quality content. Um, it ought to just be automated in this digital world. So I'd like to understand from Alfred how he believes we can get to those days sooner because uh, it's just happening um, is what I think clients and I, I also want. I'd like to not have to work hard to enjoy what's possible. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so actually, um, uh, behind the engines, you know, white, uh, just to give an example, um, to automatically detect a scene, um, we use sometimes five to six teraops of uh, calculations. The TV sees the image before the eye sees it in human, so that we can actually look at and detect the scenes and therefore do all these calculations to make sure that we have the best display capability uh, before the, the person realizes it. And particularly like, uh, like uh, uh, the previous uh, audio um, panel said, you know, we have this scene to scene change. And uh, when you go from very dark image to very bright image, first of all, you have to adapt uh, the TCON drivers, make sure that the screen goes up and all that. So that's all behind, um, you know, uh, from the consumer experience. And we do all that, right? So uh, calibration is absolutely one important thing to go forward, Tom. Uh, we calibrate every single TVs. Um, sometimes, you know, people don't realize in COVID uh, to get a TV certified is pretty hard because, uh, you know, all the planes are down. Uh, you know, international travel is <laughs> it's almost non-existence. Um, we actually work very hard behind the clock every every month to get uh, hundreds of thousands of TV uh, certified. And in Taiwan, we actually build a very uh, big centers just to get all the TVs uh, in, in in Taiwan so that we can check all the all the picture quality so that you know Bill is happy. <laughs> And HDMI LCs, um, we want to make sure that uh, that is done accurately. And actually, many of these things, as Tom has said, it was quite tough at the very beginning with the technology. But once you get, um, you know, uh, one or two models uh, start working, then basically the rest of them has come naturally, right, Tom? So um, we've been applying, uh, you know, the same methodology to apply for all, all brands, literally, to make sure that they are compliance uh, to Bill's requirement on uh, uh, on the LLC requirement in SPAC and all that. Uh, so I, I think that it come along very well in terms of, you know, bringing uh, all the TVs in compliance. Some of the TV are compromising cost. So, um, you know, we try very hard and, and very in innovative way to, to improve it, um, you know, uh, to, to, to meet the requirements there. Gentlemen, yeah, uh, 
Sorry. Think, yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, unfortunately, we're just about out of time. I think we'll have to leave it there. But thank all of you, Greg, Alfred, Tom, and Bill, for a very compelling discussion. And we're going to now summarize the entire event. Uh, in closing, we hope that all of you online today found this webinar to be informative. But like most things in our industry, the HDR10 ecosystem, as you can see, is a complex one. There's a number of technology, business, and marketing and challenges that take time and effort to resolve. However, these challenges also provide not just all of us in the industry, but the end user as well, with a host of new opportunities. Going forth, as we collaborate more closely together, hopefully those opportunities will be fully realized. So thank you all for joining us today, and have a great evening.